Welcome uh, to the second conversation in this year's Literature for Our Time series, and the first in which there is not a major snowstorm. Our guest today is the writer, editor, bon vivant, and occasional crank, Juji Gardner. Those are her words. <laughs> She is originally from Winnipeg, grew up in Calgary, went to university in Ottawa, and now lives in Vancouver. She is a former uh, senior editor for Saturday Night Magazine, a longtime reviewer for the Globe and Mail, books editor for the Georgia Strait, and I believe still the fiction editor for the Vancouver Review. Um, she teaches creative writing at the University of British Columbia, where it is no exaggeration to say, as Sarah Selecki has said, that she is shaping the face of Canadian fiction today. She is the editor of Darwin's Bastards, which is, in my opinion, the most exciting anthology of Canadian short stories since John Metcalf's 16 by 12, which is now 40 years old. And she is also, of course, the author of two acclaimed collections of her own short stories, All the Anxious Girls on Earth in 1999, and Better Living Through Plastic Explosives, published in 2011 by Hamish Hamilton of Penguin Canada. Better Living Through Plastic Explosives was a finalist for the Giller Prize. Here is a taste. Granville Island Market, through the eyes of a woman sentenced to community service as an Olympic mascot for assaulting a neighbor for using a leaf blower. Toddlers launch erratically at the birds that land on the wharf outside the market. Gulls screech and dive for rogue french fries with the precision of heat-seeking missiles. In the distance, a guitarist is trying to bring a Roberta Flack tune back from the dead. There are many who call this paradise. With the gracious support of Victoria University and Department of English at the University of Toronto, please welcome Gigi Gardner. Can I angle that way? Whichever way you like. Okay, hello, and uh, thank you very much to Nick. I, sitting up in the, um, balcony with a friend listening to that lecture. Um, I'm getting a little feedback here. Is, is everybody hearing me okay? Sounds good out here. Okay. It does. Yeah. I'll just get used to it then. And um, like we just thought, why isn't everybody bursting into applause? Like that was, you guys have no idea. Like there was nothing, like nobody, I had no prof like this. When it, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. That, that's a lot better. They can dub in the clapping, you know, they can do this now. The technology exists, right? <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and I was thinking, this is, has to be one of the coolest courses ever. And I'm not saying that just because I have been brought out here to, you know, because my, my book's on the curriculum, but like Nabokov and Elliot and Beckett and John K. Sampson, like I, I think this is one of the most exciting things that's happened to Better Living since, since the book came out. Um, I just want to say a little bit about Crazy Baby book cover, and I have a, a copy here for Nick um, awesome. because he's been so gracious. But in, <laughs> in fact, um, I actually, this is a, based on a painting my sister did, and the paint, it's a little painting, it has, it's like a baby head, and it's, all, it's got veins in its head, and then it's on a yellow background. And that's what I had wanted for my book cover, and Penguin said, it's too, it'll gross people out, it'll creep them out. So, and I, I think my book is really beautiful, but then when we were doing the launches, I suggest, they wanted to do a value added, and I suggested, and then all, all of a sudden everybody loved Crazy Baby and wanted Crazy Baby, so I think I was right. Maybe, maybe a 20, 20th anniversary edition with Crazy Baby will, um, will emerge. So after listening to all that, which I just found, um, phenomenally intense and, and, and um, interesting. And when I listen to these things, I always, and even my own things quoted back at me, it always seems like the other me or the person talking about me is much smarter than I am. I think, I did that? That's, that's sort of cool. So I'm still, <laughs> I'm still kind of reeling for that. And you've been, the bulk of you are in the class and have been reading the book, or have you, are they reading or finished the book, where, but in the midst of it? Yeah, and then you've read from it, so. <laughs> I saw some people desperately reading through when I walked in, but not rereading because they loved it so much. Maybe that was it. But so I thought, well, you know, I could read from the book, but you've read the book, and Nick has quoted extensively from the book. So I'm going to read a new story, hot off the press, and in fact, hot off the 1961 IBM Cherry Red IBM Selectric, because I've been trying to retool my brain to see if I could um, 
composed on a handwriting and typewriter, like all the people in the um, first half of your course wrote all these amazing classic works, probably handwritten or on the typewriter. None of them had computers. So these days, we're all so freaked out. Oh my god, how can you write without a computer? So I was trying to do it, and, it, and it's a slower process. And I, I couldn't tweak things as much as I usually do. So this story has, you're, I'm sort of focus grouping it with you, and it has rough edges. But it's the first love story I've ever written. And it's also very, it's very global as well. I was trying to kind of see how much of the world a very short story, I think it's under 3,000 words, could, could encompass, which is one of the things I, Nick did talk about, like what could a story be? It could be anything you want it to be as long as you can make it work. Um, the, the, what I like to talk about is the canvas of the short story could include multitudes. It can hold a lot more than people think it can hold. So two little notes. I have been playing, uh, I have three different titles for the story, and I want to take a little vote after and kind of see, after hearing the story, what you think might be the best title. So uh, the, the three titles are, and I'll repeat them at the end, are The Girl from Helsinki, Mongolian Love Song, or Laplanders. And we're also going to have a contest. Um, I have a prize for whoever can identify there's a, a pop cultural reference in the first part of the story. And you'll know the parts because I'll do, I'll go space break. Because you know on a page you can see that when you're reading you can't. So there's four different character points of view. So there's a pop cultural reference in the first part, which is fairly long, that's kind of comes up, is echoed or, or is kind of fulfilled in the second, very last section. If someone can identify that, they win the grand prize. There's also a secondary one I think is harder to find. And the ringers, being the non-students in the class, are not allowed to participate because it's just not fair. Um, just because I just like to keep the demographic sort of more close. And if nobody can identify it, uh, then the most creative answer will win. And it's. <laughs> And I was going to split the prize. Well, I may split the prize. Anyway, I have an iTunes card and a copy of my first book that Penguin just put out as a Penguin paperback. But we will just dive in. And this story was inspired by, um, I went to China last March. I was, it was pretty amazing. I'd never actually thought, oh, I'll go to China. Or, but I, I was invited to a literary festival in China. And it was a pretty overwhelming experience, and I'm still processing some of that. I was in Beijing in the south. And then uh, the story is inspired partly by that and partly by a girl crush I got on a um, young Scandinavian writer there um, who spent a few days with in China. And so anyway, that, that was the germ. And, and here's the story with no proper title yet. The boy took forever to unpack from his trip to China. He was changed. Less boy, more something. But really, despite his vigorous insights about the plight of the country's migrant workers and his refusal to wear factory-made t-shirts from Guangdong province, it was the girl from Finland who had altered his cellular structure, cracked him open like geothermal faults cleave the earth, creating deep fissures. And it was this deeply fissured self that stepped off China Eastern Airlines Flight 582 at YVR and into the arms of his younger sister while his parents stood by with their goofy grins and awaited their turns. They had held hands in Suzhou and talked about the fear of death, her favorite topic. While their rickshaw driver executed maneuvers the boy previously thought possible only through CGI. The rickshaw was an alarming pink with, a, with, an ad, with, an ad for, sorry, with an ad for American apparel on its side. The driver's arms and legs almost as thin as the spokes of his bicycle wheels. The sidewalks and streets were bright and cloudy with people. Bikes, scooters, cars and buses. The sky that day clear. The ceaseless honking and tooting by them was just white noise. There were no birds. What else is there, the girl asked, in a way that implied she didn't expect an answer. What else is it that forces us out of bed in the morning and out into the world? He had tried to be interested in the fear of death. He really had. But he was one of those preternaturally cheerful boys who called beers brewskis and added an O to the names of the boys he played lacrosse with, Marco, Winston O, Omar O. Yeah. They're not all like Steve and Jim now, right? Like, this is Canada. His cup back then was not half full or half empty, depending on your point of view. It generally runneth over. Death for the boy was a character in a bizarro comic, a joker with a scythe who had to ring the doorbell like everyone else. She was a mathematician, a few years older than him, but so what? 
The boy had just finished reading a short book on infinity his father had given him for his birthday, and he quoted from it to impress her, passing off the author's thoughts on Zeno's paradoxes as his own. He was far from a stupid boy. At 18, he was already one year into a degree in international relations with a minor in economics, but still, he just wasn't the kind of boy who thought about death a whole lot. The girl was what she called post-corporeal, not frigid, just uninterested in the body. The boy, on the other hand, the boy was all about the body. He and Nico Patches had spent the bulk of grade eight collecting an infinite list of words for penis. <laughs> I have a son who's just started grade eight, and I don't know if I should let him read the story or not. <laughs> he, um, by grade nine, they were joking in Yoda speak, no talk, do. Even as he listened to the girl thrilling to her voice, the boy's extremities still recalled the Israeli teenager at the hostel in Chengdu, how her mouth had been stinky sweet from the bowl of garlicky pork noodles she'd just eaten. If asked her name or which hand she'd held her chopsticks with, he couldn't have been able to tell you. What he had was a talent for body memory, muscle memory, his piano teacher called it. It's just a vessel, the girl from Helsinki said one night, leaning against the darkened storefront window, all the while lightly tracing his outline with her thumbs from the hips up and ending at his temples. In front of them, a toddler wearing what looked like multiple jackets and three pairs of padded pants squatted over the curb, curb waving a sparkler while his grandmother clapped and clapped her hands. They'd met during a comedy night at the Anza Club in Beijing. A guy from Adelaide had dragged the boy there. First up was a crazy Brit who doused the audience with spittle as he raged hilarious obscenities into the microphone. The Maori stand-up was another kind of creep altogether. His sensitive PC routine repulsed the boy. Um, sorry, the, his sensitive PC routine repulsed the boy. The guy's earnestness and nest of curls had to be a put on to get laid, or as the vulgar Manchester comic had put it, to make bird kebabs. The girl, I made that up. I thought that was rather clever. <laughs> the girl stood by the bar not drinking, her hands shoved into the pockets of some kind of old lady smock. As he paid for his beer, she said, sighing, they're just afraid, but they don't know it yet. The boy wondered what he would call the color of her hair if ever asked to describe it. Afraid of what, he asked, of death. That's why they're trying so hard to be funny. For a girl who wasn't about bodily pleasure, she did like to eat. The boy could hardly keep up. Maybe it was a hearty fin thing. On their final night together in a Chinese Muslim restaurant, the rats rustling along the canal walls outside, she chewed some spicy mutton and took it out of her mouth and fed it to him as if he were a newborn bird or an Inuit grandmother. Despite her preoccupation with death, there wasn't anything dark about the girl, nothing remotely goth. She was pale, yes, and had one eyebrow hair that was too long and darker than the rest that sprang around as she talked. But in her apricot sweaters and pressed jeans and white keds, she looked like something out of a toothpaste ad. As I get older, I don't feel the need to adorn myself anymore, she told him, apropos of nothing. She was all of what, 22, 23? Her own trip to China wasn't about exploration, but to attend a conference on applied mathematics for people in the tech industry. She had a few days of vacation saved up and had decided to spend them sightseeing. I love your circuitry, I really do, she told the boy as she said goodbye, touching her forehead to his, but you have no sense of your own mortality. At this point, an observer waiting for the elevator beside them in the colonial air era Nanlin Hotel, the vast lobby stretching out behind them, cigarette butts decorating all the freestanding ashtrays, a young woman in a green satin gown playing tiny dancer on a grand piano, might think, oh, for fuck's sake, he's a boy, he's supposed to feel immortal. There was a sign in the elevator at the Nanlin. If you meet the emergency condition, dial 1011. After they parted, the boy looked at his face in the bathroom mirror of his guest room and thought of the sign. The last thing the boy removed from his backpack at home was a small ginkgo leaf. The girl had found it on the path leading into the Confucian temple in Suzhou. He'd folded a, rain, a train ticket around it, and rather miraculously, the leaf hadn't crumbled into nothing. The ticket was for the fast train from Beijing to Suzhou, where the girl had decided to go on a whim. Station after station of massive gleaming platforms had punctuated their southward journey, all of them bigger than the one back home. There, the train station doubled as a bus depot and a homeless shelter. Here, all these millions, or billions? And every time I say billions, I, do you know Austin Powers, right? I want to say <laughs> billions and billions of people with briefcases and backpacks and shopping bags mounted and dismounted the fast train 
in cities that were nothing but pinpricks on a world map. Billions of people working, shopping, eating, pissing in places no one the boy knew would ever have heard of. Thinking about this had accordioned his brain like a map unfolded and then refolded poorly. Maybe that was what contemplating the fear of death felt like, jangly, ungraspable, yet exhilarating. But can a boy live well with a brain folded poorly? Okay, space break. Business took his mother to Sweden. She was in the furniture trade by way of the forestry industry. And what was Helsinki but a hop, skip, and a jump, or yump, from Stockholm? The girl's name was Katja, the boy's mother had discovered from overhearing her son mutter it in his sleep. That and from the letter she found, sealed but inexpertly hidden with the girl's name and an address care of Nokia headquarters just outside of Helsinki. Unlike a sitcom mom, she didn't steam the letter open, rehide it, and then comically fret throughout the entire episode about whether to confront her son or not. Later, she wished she had. She found it odd he was writing letters, especially to somebody who worked in a, a ground zero of the cell phone business. His own iPhone lay idle on top of a stack of equally neglected textbooks on foreign policy in the Pearson era, Stats 205 and Plato's Laws. By then, though, she found much about her son odd, even unsettling. He wasn't going to classes, had quit his lacrosse team, and was behaving like some sort of ascetic. He did his own laundry. Call 911, his sister yelled, waving her hands in mock distress the first time she saw him carrying a hamper full of neatly folded clothes upstairs. Made his own frugal meals, and when he thought he was alone in the house, he sat at the piano playing Cohen's Take This Waltz over and over, accompanying himself on his reedy tenor with his reedy tenor. He's adorable, a co-worker had assured her, a woman whose own son lived in the family basement amidst, amidst a fug of stinky concert tour t-shirts, Skrillex, and dishes with an orange patina, patina from various radioactive substances. If I was 20, I'd jump him. Yump. I got this yump thing going through this section. I don't know if it works yet or not, but yump. This was one of her un many unspoken fears. What she saw was a boy wasting away in a kind of spiritual miasma. Before he stopped taking his runs through the cemetery along Fraser, a new route since his return from China, she'd offered to join him a couple of times. He was one of those rare boys who didn't mind being seen with his mother. I'm good, he'd said, holding up a palm crossing guard style, his eyes receding tail lights in the dark. By the time she left for Sweden, he'd stopped leaving the house altogether. Her husband said, at least he still showers and told her she'd forgotten what it was like to be young and in love. He said this politely, but pointedly. Her son looked so small when she left, like an eyelash curled on his pillow, a smudge of ash. A little mini space break. The young red-headed technical manager at the Ikea warehouse in Uppsala smacked his fist down on a stack of samples and told her, I am so fucking sick of the veneer marauding as the real thing. He no doubt meant masquerading, but weren't they all? She was looking over the specs for a new line of kitchen cabinets, Mojolby, M-J-O-L-B-Y. The, the, I looked up when I was doing my um, Once We Were Swedes story and the way Ikea names furniture, different things of furniture, like based on like uh, geographical places, like furniture is based on geographical places in Sweden. So I just picked something for the cabinets that looked Ikea-ish. And he must have mistaken her for someone half her age, bearing his soul like that, so much worse than if he'd just grabbed her ass. Poor pimply-faced ginger. How horrified he would be if he knew how unattractive she found him in his existential crisis. The next day, over an irresistible second blinny at the czarist restaurant near her Helsinki hotel, the boy's mother thought yet again about the terrible burden of love. Unlike the rest of her family, she'd long housed a fear of death that colored every decision she made. It started at age 10 with an unnameable terror that her own mother would die suddenly, leave the house one afternoon and never return, having plunged her car into the Glenmore Reservoir down through the ice, a worry aided by her mother's frequent threats to do this very thing. <laughs> Throughout her single years, it was her own death she fretted about, a case of health anxiety blossoming into rampant hypochondria. Then when she fell in love with her future husband, the fear jumped, yumped, to him, I, know it's so, I, I am very self-indulgent. I, I put these things in and then I wonder whether I should take them out, but it, I think it works better on paper than out loud. A delayed bedtime call during, the business trip would, during a business trip would trigger visions of herself in widow's weeds and have her digging through file boxes in search of her husband's Sun Life insurance policy. And now it's slumped, a fat leering cloud over the heads of her children. 
It begat and begat and begat through all the freaking exhausting years of it, the years of lymphoma scares and untended crosswalks and avalanche danger and pit parties gone bad and school shootings, through the years of scrutinizing jars in the grocery store for expiry dates and cans for any dings that might indicate the presence of tomato sauce gone ultra toxic. And now she felt melon balled, her reserves scooped out. And this Katya, this numerically gifted Laplander and prize melancholic was going to pay. Outside it was dark already, although just past one in the afternoon. Her brown plush coat shining white in the eternal twilight of the Finnish winter. She felt warm and large and the growl in her throat threatened to burst into a roar. And like that, she pounded west to where the city flattened out along the Z. One paw smacking down on the sidewalk after the other, the pavement splitting beneath her claws, running now, yowling for blood. Okay, next section. Would it have hurt her to have slept with him? To have taken his cock into her mouth? She liked the way the Canadian boy had watched her as she talked, as if he was, con this isn't the mother now anymore. <laughs> You're watching too much Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah. Okay, as if he was concentrating on reading dialogue bubbles while trying to make out her thought bubbles as well. But he hadn't attracted her in that way, so it had been more satisfying to act as if life was about so much more. She hadn't had a decent conversation with a fellow Canadian in a while, but she'd affected that laughable Finnish accent at the Anza Club and didn't want him to think her shallow or mean, so she just kept it up. And it was easy to pretend to be from Finland. Nobody knew anything about the place. The death thing, though, the death thing was real. The girl whose name was not Katya thought about the boy while she fucked her fiancé, the cultural attaché to the British Embassy in Beijing. She thought about the boy while she assured anxious American business travelers in the lobby of the Japanese boutique hotel on San, San Lutum, where she was interning as a concierge trainee. She thought about the boy while she bathed in her fiancé's tub with the exceptional soaps the hotel provided its guests. Then she decided, because she was a practical girl from Oakville, who dreamt not in watercolors, but crisp Modrian blocks. Apologies to all girls from Oakville. <laughs> okay, who dreamt not in watercolors, but crisp Modrian-like blocks to stop thinking about him altogether. Just once, years later, did she think about him again. After her divorce, she took her teenage kids to China for the first time, and, uh, to, uh, and they made an expedition to a section of the Great Wall. This part I had to handwrite out the final copy because my my typewriter ribbon screwed up before I left home, and I did this in my hotel room this morning, so bear with me. Um, there was a donkey up on the wall looking baleful as a group of school children snapped photos. It could have been a descendant of the donkey that had been on the wall when she visited with the boy. They'd held up steaming cups of tea sold to them by a vendor who had shiny stumps where his hands should have been. She had talked about the Great Wall holding off death and the deaths of people who had died thousands of years before, those thousands of years in the thundering Mongol hordes reflected in the donkey's mild eyes. While her kids yelled for her to come on, mom, she looked down through a crenellation and the thought of what it would be like to fall never entered her mind. Do you understand, she had asked the boy all those years ago, do you? Last section. Tico Pekka nodded his head along to the Leningrad cowboys and sucked back on his Nokia bud while reading the mail that had been piling up for someone called Katja H in location data. The mail room in the basement of Nokia House was a lonely place in the age of email, text messaging, and Skype, especially if you were the sole employee of the department. No real room for advancement. It was tough to be a Finn without ambition. These days, what with all the composers and conductors and designers they were sending out into the world like so much dandelion fluff, ambassadors of cool, but Tico Pekka wasn't without his own plans. Until the letters started arriving, the only mail that did, save for invoices and the occasional box containing a mangled cell phone along with angry notes scrawled by head cases, Tico, got, Tico Pekka got wasted, listened to music, and planned out his latest parkour moves. He was working up to putting on a real show, a jaw dropper, up and down the rooftops of the fortress-like headquarters, looping fluidly down the sloped glass wall of building C, using hands, feet, knees, elbows, and finishing up with a flourish on the company helipad that jutted out over the sea. That's what he was working up to. For now, he satisfied himself with the benches and the plinths of the statuary in Espoo Park. And then I have this bit I'm 
haven't written yet where his mom always asks him why he comes home all sweaty and he just says, oh, I'm working out because he doesn't want to have to explain parkour to her because she'll like start swatting him with a dish rag. <laughs> but even Picasso first had to learn perspective, didn't he? Tico Pekka had tried rather diligently, he thought, to find the recipient of the letters and was on the verge of taking some initiative and sending them back to Vancouver, Canada, a place he hoped one day to take his parkour tour when the mishap, mishap took place. While rubbing a fleck of hot ash from one of the envelopes, he tore a hole through it and heck, eh, as his pop used to say, he opened it up and began to read. Now Tico Pekka was in love. He should have been in love with this Katja H, she of the electrifying fingers and toasted marshmallow hair and transform, transformative sense of mortality. Uh, but it was the letter writer, James, who he daydreamed of. James, who felt clean and light for the first time in his life, just quotes from the letters. James, who wrote of dead magazines and train stations the size of galaxies. And so it was that down in the bowels of, the techno of this technology center in the enveloping darkness of an early winter afternoon, Tico Pekka didn't hear the Sorry, Tico Pekka didn't hear the caviar-scented roar that shook all the glass, the all-glass south side of the, the building, the smack of the enormous paw that cracked the helipad in two, submerging it in the waters of the tojia like a broken biscuit in tea. He was lounging on a garbage barge on a South China canal, the oarsman, a wooden-toothed singer who sang a Mongolian love song, while Tico Pekka held the hollowed-out Canadian lover in the palm of his hand. The song was simultaneously complex and simple. The Mongol raiders tenderize their meat by placing it under their saddles and pine for their sweethearts as they ride. The grass has a pewter gleam like grass at dawn in a black and white movie. They move over the stiff grass, teeth gleaming, thinking of tender flesh of their sweethearts, the bitter cold, as in the distance there rises a spindle of smoke and beyond it, the great wall. Thanks. Yeah. So, any any thoughts as to the for the contest? Pardon? And, and where do, where does Yoda speak follow up later? <laughs> Good try. Yes. Yep. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I haven't read that book, but hold that thought. You, that might be the most creative answer. That, right over here. Um, you, 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 talked about the cultural you have to speak up. You talked about the cultural attache at one point. Yep. Um, was that anything to do with the birdcage? Yeah. <gasps> so what I'm asking yeah. is there's a pop cultural reference, like something out of pop culture in the first section, that's the boys section. And then there's an echo of it in the, at the very end of the story, in the last couple of paragraphs. Anybody? Yes? The uh, tiny dancers mentioned in the, in the, in the first section. Yes. That's the song at the end of the... Uh... <laughs> you were amazing. You're wonderful writer. My God! Oh my God! Oh my God! You win a copy of my first oh, book and a $15 iTunes card. Oh, it's reading week and all. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I am, that's so great. I, there was another one. It was harder. It was, he plays Leonard Cohen's Take This Waltz. And then there's a little quote from it at the end. I, I didn't think anybody would get it. I wouldn't even get it because Dead Magazines is a bit in the song, but that's very obscure. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is this is yours, right? Yeah. Okay. Now what do we do? We'll sit down. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Okay, awesome. I was going to go with Stephen Hawking. Really? No, the, the, the infinity. Wasn't he reading some science book? Oh, that was I David Foster that. Wallace. I should have, oh, that oh, would have been a good one. That, who, wrote the, who wrote the short book on infinity? You would have got that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he, if it was two prizes, he would have gotten both. <laughs> All right. So, welcome and thank you for coming. Yeah. And thank, thank you for treating us to like a new story. What about I the was, title? Are we going to yeah, ask? Oh, them? yeah, like, yeah. So, uh, The Girl from Helsinki, uh, the Mongolian love song, or Laplanders, just pick one. I'm, we're going to have an applause meter. 
So just pick one in your mind and I'm going to say them and whichever gets the loudest applause I will consider very seriously and then still go with my gut instinct. But it will, <laughs> having heard the story, this will be helpful to me. Okay, so Girl from Helsinki. <laughs> Mongolian love song. Laplanders. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you why I didn't, why I dropped Girl from Helsinki, because there's too many girl this, and then my first book is All the Anxious Girls on Earth, so I thought it might make the story sound too chicklity. Anyway, so I'll think about it. Okay. When uh, Lynn Crosby was a guest in the class a few years ago, and she was working on a collection of her new short stories, and she asked the student, same sort of question. She said, blood on the gizmo? was one option, or life is about losing everything. And they universally said blood on the gizmo. And then the book comes out and was it's called- Wasn't you guys though, right? It, well, no, it was their not previous incarnation. <laughs> and then it came out and it was life is about losing everything. So we know not to trust you, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, oh, um, can I say the thing about the cover? Yes, please. So it was very cool that Nick, oh, did I talk about the cover? No, well, yes, a little bit at the beginning. You oh said yeah, that, okay, forget it, I'm just tired. <laughs> I thought I hadn't done it. I am so deeply grateful to you for bringing me one of those. I have to sign up for this you. This is awesome. It's like a talk show thing, right? Yes. Okay. It's exactly, it's exactly like a talk show thing. <laughs> Except it doesn't, it doesn't have a real host, but you know. Yeah. Um, Darwin's Bastards, I wanted to ask oh, you. Yeah. Did you give the writers any kind of guidelines at all? I mean, are, are, were some of those stories already existing, or okay. were they all solicited? Did you, what did you tell the them? The bulk of them were solicited. Okay. Uh, I commissioned a few. I, I was wary of commissioning. There's a difference between putting out a, a limited call for submission to writers, which is, I'm doing X thing, try to explain what it is, and if you have a story or can write a story by X time that fits, I will look at it. But not a, wide, not a public call, but a limit, like personal, but I can't, uh, guaranteed publishing it, and then we needed some names, so there were, the, the, Gibson was a commission, and he was quite thrilled to take it on, I was really pleased. It's a big deal. Pleased. Yeah, I actually, we needed, and Doug Copeland's had the story, and it hadn't been published, but he had had a story, he said, it's perfect, but it's running in McSweeney's, and then we did a, a version of it, I, we did it differently. Um, most of them, like Timothy Taylor's was a commission, um, and the rest were, some, uh, Lee's was a commission, Lee Henderson, and the rest were, that are in there were mostly submit, I don't have it in front of me, but there were a few previously existing, but mostly, or I knew they existed, a few of them were by um, thesis, former thesis students of mine, I knew the, which, which is one of the reasons I thought about doing the book, because I was seeing these stories, or right. I thought, oh man, there's something here, these stories all kind of go together, like wouldn't it be cool to put them in one book? Yeah. So some of those existed, but were re edited further, and others just came, surprisingly through, someone said, like one of the stories in there by David Witten, um, that, that were, there were this kind of the Danish, uh, they're in the ship, and yeah. the ship, and yeah. that, he was a friend of another writer who had asked a story from, and this writer's uh, Elise Friedman, who's also in the book, um, she said, my friend has the story that would be perfect, could he send it to you, and, okay. I, and I, he ended up being great to work with him, yeah. There was a, the, the launch in Vancouver was a, a costume party, I here guess. Here too, but or less well? people, yeah, we had it at the Gladstone Ballroom, and but less people wore costumes. Did you wear the same costume to both? I did. I actually had a um, voice modulator I rented from Long and McQuaid, and I did like voices, and, and I had this full like tank girl meets something kind of costume, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I put I rented the voice modulator and lied to them at Long and McQuaid about I couldn't get it back till the day after you need it back because I my son's sick at home and put it in a suitcase and lugged it to Toronto and I used it at the Gladstone too and we had a cabaret style launch there and Matthew Trafford dressed as um, Charles Darwin and answered questions and it was very cool. cool. Yeah. Is, is, is the book sort of consciously, you know, kick, kicking against the pricks of can lit at all? I mean, Which you, one? Darwin's, well, oh, I thought Darwin's, you I mean, all my Darwin's Bastards, Darwin's I guess Bastards I'm very, this. Well, I guess what I'm asking really very is Very specifically like, against the kind of thing we yeah. do for anthologies. I'm, yeah. I've been, there's been attempts to do like edgy anthologies, but they're, they're always, there's rarely commissioned anthologies in fiction. That's usually stuff that already exists and people put it together. And I always find it disappointing when I pick up one and I've read half the stories, yeah. even the ones I like elsewhere. So that was part of it. And it was just liking this kind of story and knowing a book of these kind of stories isn't going to come out in Canada. Is, is it your sense, like, does Canlit in your mind uh, have any particular 
fixations or you know or preoccupations that that, well, that you I, don't share and that you see yourself as trying to to alter or provide alternatives to well the realism thing i think is still deeply deeply rooted but i that may it's less deeply rooted i think in the u.s and um britain right i mean yan martel's life of pi was not even nominated for any awards in Canada and then won the Booker and the rest is history. Right. And we just, back then, like now we might look at something like that because we've learned our lesson depending on the jury, juries, but we tend to be so fixated with realism. A really interesting experience I had this past year was um, because of Darwin's Bastards, I was asked to be on the jury of something called the Sunburst Award. Do you know this? No. It's the Sunburst Award for Canadian literature of the fantastic. Yes, okay. And they award, it's, it's like quite a big deal. Yeah. And it, they, they, it's for adult and YA. And it's, the, it, it's, it's almost like you have to compare, you know, uh, apples to Studebakers. Like, you, there's, because you're, it's sci-fi, dystopian, um, fantasy, magic. Um, and then all the, the paranormal and all this stuff all lumped into one. And I was the only non kind of speculative writer on the jury, but okay. I was, and it was a fascinating experience. And the books we shortlisted, both for the YA and the um, adult books, were, and other ones that I love that, you know, we didn't come to meet minds on, were among the best written books I've ever read hmm. by Canadian writers, and I had never heard of these people. The book that won, is by a guy called Jeff Ryder, and it's uh, Reimer, and it's called Paradise Tales. He was born here, he lives in England. It's a, one of the best books of short stories I've ever read, do, do and we've think, never heard of the guy. Do you think that divide between genre fiction and sort of literary fiction, is it as pronounced in other countries or it is here? Is it, is it a consequence of the way our bookshelves, our bookstores set their shelves up? Is it a consequence of the way university classes set their classes up? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know the university landscape, but um, oh, you mean creative writing departments? Well, no, stuff, I'm thinking or? about, you know, when we do science fiction, like yeah. even here in the English department at U of T, yeah. it's its own course. Well, I'll tell you something interesting. I, I think it's, and it's similar south of the border. You get someone like Jonathan Lethem, who's yeah. one of my favorite writers, and he's now been appointed to the Giller jury this year. Just read that yesterday. And he started out writing, um, he's best known for Fortress of Solitude and Motherless Brooklyn. And, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but uh, he started out doing these, genre mashup things so he'd have a gumshoe noir a, a sci-fi no gumshoe book his first book uh, um gun what is it gun with sudden music or something like gun with a ca gun comma with occasional music and it the detective's a kangaroo and it's science fiction you know kind of meets raymond chandler and he does and then he had a sci-fi meets academic satire you know the the the, the, the academic satire blah blah and he made, he had a cult following from these things in books of stories, and then he wrote Motherless Brooklyn, which was, again, not, it was, you know, satirical, mm -hmm. gangster, a guy with Tourette's who mm -hmm. drives for a gangster, helps solve these weird crimes. There was a Pynchon-esque element to it. And then he sort of broke through, but right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tough one. William Gibson, his last three books, yeah. have not been remotely speculative or science fiction. Hmm. They are set in the now, and he has made this case over and over again, and, he's there, and then the novels will be reviewed, and they'll say, the latest science fiction novel by William Gibson. You can't right. shake it. Right. And, the, and, and he said it's not, and it's not. I've read them. It's like Americans who still think that McGill's a good university. Yeah. You know? <laughs> once, once you get that reputation. So I kind of rambled there, but what was interesting with the Sunburst thing, there was the stuff that the literary reader would consider genre because it was un, not realistic. But within the reading I did, like let's say there's these 150 books, and here's 60 that are as well written, as literary as any, you know, anything nominated for the Giller or the GG or anything like that, except that it takes place on another world or, you know, the character has powers or there's a, one of the ones I just loved was it's sort of like, um, it was sort of like, um, what's the, what's the, oh, Deliverance, like, sweet, oh, like a pig boy, is that Deliverance? Um, it was like, it was like Deliverance and the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, meet zombies, you know, this kind of thing. The, the writing was unfreaking believable. Mm. And then there's the genre, genre books, which right. are the parent, if I never see another paranormal romance <laughs> again, or what was the other one? Oh, they're called urban fantasy. I will just run, not walk the other way, like these books. I mean, they're basically like Harlequins, but with, you know, zombies? witches and zombies and angels, 
There's hunky angels. <laughs> there's, there's, um, <laughs> anyway. I wonder, better living through plastic explosives. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of interest in, in Darwin and evolution. And did you, do you think we're evolving? Like, in any way, is there a sense that the characters, or the, no, do you, are human, we evolving? The human race? Yeah, like in what ways do you think we're evolving? Well, and, and is that something, is that a concern of the stories, is to capture that? And I'm also concerned with the idea that we may be devolving, devolving. because there's this whole idea that the more science can do for us and the more we can escape our bodies, you know, what, what, is, what will be left to us? I mean, this is one reason I, you know, that I've wanted to unplug. I don't know if it's for a year. I don't know if it's for okay. how long. And okay. I've had to do cheats. I've had to send, you know, I had to go to this festival in Ireland in the, the fall and, and I, I kind of made a line for myself. Oh, if it's something I committed to before I went offline, I had to follow through. So I had to send some JPEGs to them. And then I had to write something for NPR when my book came out in the States. And I wanted to type it and have someone scan it. And my publishers, assist, the young publicist, freaked out because she didn't know what to tell the Americans. They would think we're crazy and that we wouldn't get to be on NPR. So I just and she said, doesn't have a cell phone. You know? Yeah, anyway. So it's all quite doable, but you know, pe people are freaked out about doing anything where there's that extra step, right? right. But I'm, I am worried about, you know, what, what, what the planet's going to look like, what we're going to look like. I mean, there's an old Kurt Vonnegut story. Maybe you remember the name of it. It was it, the first story in, his, in Welcome to the Monkey House no. where people, you know, and there's been millions of sci-fi things right, written like this, but people, you know, if you watch Star uh, Trek, you see it, where the body, the mind's so developed, the body's no longer needed. And so even in that new story, I'm playing with that idea of, you know, the mind and the body. Is the body just a vessel? Or, or is this all, like, is it inextricable? Like you're, and what is this thing called soul, even if we're not religious? What is this essence of us? So, so if we manage to shrug off the body entirely, what does that, how does that all What's the, the human? point of that? Right. Like I have this friend who once said, you know, it'd be so great if we could just, you know, like people who actually would take a pill, like if they didn't, you know, could get all their nutrition. But like I'm such a pig and glutton. Like my favorite thing is to sit around eating and drinking with friends. Like what would happen then? Like it just, it seems unbelievable to me that someone would want that, that cleansing, that purity of uh, the no mess, the no blood, the no, no right. not even a gnarled vegetable, you know. Yeah, I can't imagine I'm kind a, of, a dinner party with pills. I think I'm just going, <laughs> I no forget what I the can. question was. No, it's okay. <laughs> He's asking me to be a seer. I don't know. Um, but I'm very interested in Darwin. I love Darwin. The stories in there are, are, are very, very current. How do you do that? How do you stay current? You mean you like a voracious consumer? Of, you spend like four hours a day on the internet? Is it, is it having a younger son that helps? I mean, the, how do you, do you, do you make this a conscious sort of research strategy to, to, to go out there? I and, just, or is it just the stuff just shows up? The stuff just shows up and really my one only, I don't even have TV, I, you know, I was online a lot until I went offline. Yeah. But I didn't really do a lot of news online. I was more, I had three emails and was, it just became a burden. And I did, and I Googled a lot and it was interesting having to write a story where I had to go get an atlas. Right. And kind of look up something and if it wasn't in the atlas I had to go to the library. Like it really does slow the process down. But um, well, I read the Globe and Mail every okay. day and, and Really, most of what I get is from the New Yorker and the Globe and Mail and ads and being out in the street and just seeing things and hearing things and yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit. I want to give them some time. And I do. Partial. Having a thirteen-year-old doesn't does make hurt. I can ask them things now. Yeah, yeah. Like what? But, what would kids do if blah 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 blah? You know. Right. I wanted to ask you too about uh, this this incredibly interesting thing you're doing right now, the Orphans Project. Oh, um, okay. Which Harper has just, I gather, just picked up. Do you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about this? Oh, well, again, this is one of those um, necessity is the mother of invention kind of thing. Um, well, I was heading to the few months before this Cork Festival, which is in September. So in the early summer, um, there's a magazine, a, a online magazine called Five Dials out of London. And they were doing an all cork issue. So everybody who was heading to the fest, like Lydia Davis mm -hmm. from the huge, amazing short story writer from the States had sent them five new stories. It turned out the five new stories from Lydia Davis were, they were all a sentence long. But anyway, at the time I thought, oh my God, how would she do that? <laughs> and, and I was finishing something, but then I didn't, 
think it was worthy. Like I didn't want to put it out there and I didn't really have anything I wanted at the time they needed it. And I tried and tried. And then finally I, I contacted them and said, well, I, I don't have anything, but I, I have this idea and it may be kind of wacky. This is one of the last emails I sent when I was supposedly off email, but I had to deal with this. I, I have this thing where I have all these, I've been going through my files and I have all these beginnings of stories, like a line or two or a whole opening, like ranging from 1996 right up until 20, like a month, before, like that month, where I either was never going to write the story or I tried to write the story and couldn't write the story. And I thought, what if we just do these, print these endings that, you know, I'm just putting out into the world. And I, and I said, people can actually adopt them if they want. And then they love that idea, so I came up with the idea that I would actually be putting these orphan story openings, there were 11 of them, up for adoption. And people could write to me at a PO box number, and I would send an adoption certificate. And they could do with it what they will. And, and uh, Hamish Hamilton, or um, Five Dials decided if anybody followed through and wanted to send it to them, they'd consider publishing it, and they did a big editorial on it. And then uh, Harper's Magazine saw this and ran it as one of their readings at the front. This this last month, January. Last month, yeah. Yeah. And so, but I even got into the contents page, and I was very excited about that. So I've gotten, I've sent out seven or eight. Some people ask for the same story, so I had to write and say that one's already adopted. Would you consider blah blah blah? How many are left? Four. Wow. But one of them, I've decided I may want to tackle again. So I'm kind of pretending it's not left, but somebody wrote to me, in fact, from Finland, <laughs> before I wrote the Finland story. Um, and I, it was a really creepy card with a cool stamp. And another guy had written for the same story, and it was a Mary Pickford postcard. And I couldn't tell, because I'd been traveling, like which one arrived first, and I wanted to be fair. But then I thought, how could I send it to the guy who sent the Mary Pickford postcard, as opposed to the person who sent the other one, so I offered another story to the other person. A couple of people in, I, cu couple from Ireland, one guy sent me the story already, a couple of people in UK, and someone in Canada, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll just, I'll read you one of them, this is my favorite one, it's oh, called okay. Lawn Boy. So like, opening sentence and you can adopt. I don't know if this one's still available yet or not. They say that if a house is on fire, and a woman has to choose between her child and another, her husband, her lover, she will choose the child. What if I told you I would choose differently? What do you think of me now? Okay, that, that was the it? one. That was the one the Mary Pickford card and the Finland card wanted, and they were both <laughs> guys. Really? Yeah, and I was like, whoa. Oh. So yeah, that one was the first one taken, believe okay. it or not. Yeah. Okay, so very quickly, I, okay. I have these ten questions that I, okay. I, I. These are just speed questions. You say the first thing that pops in your head. Okay. I stole these from inside the actor's studio. Okay. James this Lipton. isn't the Proust questionnaire. No, it's okay. a little. It's different. It's nowhere near as intelligent as the Proust questionnaire. Okay. This is just flat out silly. Okay. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, I know that. Okay. Uh, like, sure. uh, like, an, <laughs> like, well, I would have been really good and it would have been a lot less stressful and, and I would have made more money. I would have liked to be an event coordinator, like a party organizer. Uh, and you think an event coordinator is an unstressful position? No, 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 but it would, you, I just think I'd be good at it and they okay. could do it, the adrenaline thing. Like when I did the Darwin's cabarets and I loved doing parties. Oh, okay, and, okay, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. okay. Or a dame, like in the old days. I would have just liked to be one of those, like, broads, like. <laughs> what do you do? I'm a broad. <laughs> I thought of that sometimes. That's a good gig. Yeah. You know? Before we knew about cancer and stuff. <laughs> um, what profession would you not like to do? Oh, anything involves, uh, like, a doctor, a dentist, any touching people's body parts. And, okay. yeah. No, I wouldn't even do massage. What is your favorite curse word? Mm, probably fuck. Okay. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? That's my Oprah question. Oh, I love the Zhuzhi bird. This is a, it's a black capped chickadee. Um, we named it the Zhuzhi bird before we, we knew what it, we identified it and it goes outside our window starting in the spring and continuing through and, and it goes like this, Zhuzhi, Zhuzhi. <laughs> And I talk back to it, and it always answers. That's pretty. And then my husband will say, do you hear it? And I'm really bad at hearing. So everyone hears the Zhuzhi bird before I do, and then I'll say, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's very egotistical of me. But 
What <laughs> sound or noise do you hate? Oh, God, I hate so many sounds and noises. Um, I'm really sensitive, but um, probably the guy, the, the, I, after I wrote the story with the truck guy, I got my own truck guy. Like I do a garden in my back alley and there's a guy fixing his truck all summer behind my house. <laughs> and my, my office is right there too. And on and on, and he, and he actually was cutting the truck bed with a, some kind of, what do you cut a truck bed with? Like a flame? Torch? A torch. Yeah. And drilling through it. And it, I, I actually went out one time and said, is this gonna keep up all summer? <laughs> And he said to me, are you going to keep that up all summer? Like, I'm planting flowers. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> and he was really, like, and, and I thought the truck guy in the story loves the women, and my truck guy hated me. But, the, <laughs> like, these kind of noises people think they can do all, like, all day long on a summer Sunday and make all this horrible noise like they're the only people on the planet. I just abhor that. I think it's really, oh, leaf blowers. Yes, that's another I was one. Kidding. I think leaf blowers. The devils, the devils, yeah. the yeah. devils, the devil's engine, tools, yeah. yeah. The devil's tools. Yeah. I actually think that. We have them here, too. It's like amazing. People they, have like they a do, lot that's they have, 10 They feet exude by more feet. pollution, a leaf blower, during a certain amount of time than 10 cars driving down the street. It's horrible. They should be banned. At <laughs> any point in your life, was there a television show that you watched faithfully, religiously, had to see every episode up? Oh, there were so many. Pick one, you know, like from one? any, any, well, okay too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the Brady Bunch there you go. and Star That's Trek. Cool. The Brady Bunch and Star Trek. I can sing the song. No. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, what singer, group, or song do you identify with your last year of high school? Oh, God. This is, no. Can't do it. Well, you can pass. Dates myself too You much. can pass. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll do one. How okay. about a... Uh, <laughs> Hooked on a feeling. Hooked on a feeling, okay. Hooked on a feeling, I'm high on believing. Yeah. That was really <laughs> random. I have to think now. about this one. Yeah. Um, if you could go for dinner or drinks with any author, living or dead, who would it be? Hmm. Hmm. That's just, you know, I know these dinner party questions are always hard. I'm just going to say Darwin because I... He's quite pleasant. Like, some of them would be really unpleasant, or you'd have to, like, entertain them. Did he like to eat, do you know? Yeah, he had a bad stomach, but I, right. I'm sure he'd be good company. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what book is beside your bed right now? Oh, okay, there's a couple. I'm reading, because, you know, when you read, you read more than one book at a time. So I am currently a, th a third of, the, about a quarter of the way through the, the second um, Game of Thrones, The Clash of the Kings. And also about a third of the way through The Bostonians by Henry Miller. Hmm. And then a pile of magazines. Um, what? Uh, oh, and the new George Saunders. I just bought it with me. So it's by my bed at the hotel. Okay. The, yeah. Do you have a, 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 a pet peeve about our society? Other than leaf, other than leaf blowers. <laughs> Read I know, the book. I know. It's Read a ridiculous question. Yeah. <laughs> I was bracing myself. Where do you want me to start, Nick? Okay, Alphab I'll, do, alphabetically? I'll do one of my favorite ones is when you, because I just experienced this again for the millionth time. You get to the airport and you go get your luggage and then people get their cards and then they shove it right up. They go up and then they, they shove it up and they're all like right there and shoved up as if like, and then, you know, you can't, I don't know why people do that. <laughs> and I, one time after a really horrible, now I try to be calm because this one guy, like I, I actually, went ram, I, I actually said, I rammed into people, I, excuse me, I said, and th there's other people here, and then the guy turned to me and he said, take a chill pill, lady, and then everybody's staring, and I felt, <laughs> but that is a pet peeve, I, it just doesn't make sense, like, I would never go and just press my legs against it and wait for my bag, like, my bag's the only one right. coming down the thing, but that's what's the problem, that's the problem with humanity, like, these are all probably perfectly nice people acting like, you know, um, there's something about like that selfish situation. selfish idiots, yeah, I, I, yeah. And, it, and it happens time and time again. Yeah. Like just, Roads are yeah. bad for that as yeah. well. I, I, that's a small one. I have many. <laughs> many. Well, listen, folks, okay. we, are, we are... Does this help you with your papers? Or? It does, <laughs> indubitably. I was hoping to be very helpful. We yeah. are out of time. I had wanted to offer you the chance to ask some questions, but I'm conscious oh. of the clock, and, and that's my fault. I ran long in the first bit. I Do can you answer have time? in the can lobby. I'll, and sign I'll just some books? stay. Can I sign books or answer questions. We'll get you, we can, is that okay? If anybody wants. So yeah. I just, let's just thank our guests for coming, and thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
Have a good reading week, folks.